There's been a lot of talk about products made in the USA recently, and we thought this Labor Day weekend was the perfect time to check in on one entrepreneur's mission, to bring back that label and at least some of those jobs. Our cover story is reported by John Blackstone. Here we are in Middlesex, North Carolina, and this is a knitwear plant. Six years ago, this apparel manufacturer in rural North Carolina was ready to close until Bayard Winthrop helped buy the company. You know, we've spent nationally much of the last 40 years moving manufacturing overseas to chase cheap labor and lower environmental standards and, and lower regulations. In 1980, almost 80% of the clothing bought here was made in America. Today, it's around 3%. Winthrop says while well, globalization and trade deals made goods cheaper, they also brought decades of layoffs and plant closures. Manufacturing plants are moving to where the workers are cheap. We just can't compete with those prices. I'm a free trade person, but I also am a believer in saying, wait a second, you cannot gut a bunch of communities in the U.S. and move to Bangladesh and, 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 and then import all those goods back again and sell them at the local dollar store to all these people that now no longer have jobs. Sound familiar? We are living through the greatest jobs theft in the history of the world. President Trump is by no means the first to campaign on bringing back manufacturing jobs. There will be a job sucking sound going south. There will be no more NAFTA sellouts of American workers. 1.2 million new manufacturing jobs right here in America. I think if they don't make a deal, it's going to be very bad for China. President Trump's answer has been tariffs and trade wars. But back in 2012 in San Francisco, Bayard Winthrop set about bringing back manufacturing jobs the old-fashioned way by creating them. I mean, this is just a heavier gauge. On the red, on the ribby. Winthrop's but previous experience ribby. had been on Wall Street and in Silicon Valley. But he started his own clothing company with a big name, American Giant, and an even bigger goal, making everything from start to finish in the United States. Like a few other clothing companies trying to manufacture in the U.S., there's a big challenge. All those closed factories have left a threadbare infrastructure for actually making apparel, like American Giant's flannel shirt. This was an art that had almost died in America? Well, it had effectively died. I mean, we actually had to bring uh, one of the great yarn dyers effectively out of retirement to come back and help de develop, de deliver this program. Creating work meant creating a supply chain involving multiple steps. We followed the chain for American Giant's hoodie and learned the jobs are not what they used to be. <laughs> The seeds of Winthrop's big idea are found on farms like this one in Enfield, North Carolina, where cotton is planted in the spring. Wallace, I need some uh, asphalt this morning, right quick, please. Grower Jerry Hamill is looking for help, but says few are up to the job. The labor force here, the ones that will work, are working, and some are not going to work. It makes no difference what they are offered, what kind of money, what kind of benefits, they just are not going to work. So each season, Hamill hires men from Mexico on temporary worker visas. Come fall, they'll pick the cotton and transfer it to the local gin, which removes the seeds. The next stop is Parkdale Mills in Gaffney, South Carolina, where raw cotton is cleaned and spun into yarn. Parkdale Mills has more in common with Silicon Valley than it does with the mill seen in the 1979 movie, Norma Ray. I think you better try to speed it up some if you can. I'm going as fast as I can. Yeah. Well, they're watching me. I come into your mill, I expect to see Sally Field, and I see robots instead. You know, to stay in business today, you have to automate. Andy Warlick and, is its uh, CEO. And we couldn't survive competing against the world if we weren't automated. Probably have more robots here than we have employees, but the employees are well trained to operate those robots. And it's been the key to our survival. In the 1960s, a mill like this would have employed 2,000 workers. Today, about 125 work here, producing about 2 million pounds of yarn a week. It's then knitted into fabric and sent a few miles away to Carolina Cotton Works, 
where it's dyed and dried. What's happening is the wire on the rolls on the machine. Yeah. There are a series of hook, hook wire on the rolls. Yeah. Founder Paige Ashby and sons Hunter and Brian started working with Winthrop in 2013 after realizing he wasn't the typical client. It contradicted the conventional thinking of taking cost out and offering something cheaper than everybody else. And on top of everything else, he's going to make it a couple hundred miles from here in North Carolina. My response was, this is the guy we've been dreaming about. Where has he been for the past 15 years? For the final stop, the finished fabric goes to the knitwear plant Winthrop helped buy, Eagle Sportswear where it's cut and sewn into actual clothing. The sweatshirt is so complicated, there's so many parts that each modular line is only making a part of the sweatshirt. To improve productivity, Winthrop replaced the traditional assembly lines with groups of sewers working in teams. They get extra pay for exceeding daily quotas. This is an example right here of a three-woman modular sew line. There's a readout over here, which those numbers basically are telling you that our expectation for this team is 73 units at this point in the day. They're at 90. Their efficiency is at 123 percent. Do you make yeah. more money? Yeah, it's more money and did. Thelma Aguilar has worked here 21 years. So you try to be very efficient yeah, all day. Yeah, we try every day. So I'm holding you up <laughs> from keeping your, yeah, meeting your goal while, there. Yeah. You have to pay these people a good deal more than you would if they were sewing in yep, China yep. or Vietnam. Yeah, I would just argue that's a good thing, right? Keeping this final step here in the U.S., Winthrop says, adds as much as $17 to the total cost of the hoodie. To reduce overhead, American Giant sells almost entirely online with only two stores. So the final price tag for the hoodie we've followed from the cotton fields to the gin to the mill to the dyer to the knitwear plant, to the store, is no bargain. $108. Sweatshirt, it's $108. Yeah. You pay $108 yeah. for a sweatshirt. What we really want to do with this particular item is make something that you are going to have for decades. In this era of fast fashion, Winthrop may seem out of step. But despite its lofty price tag, his hoodie has been selling well ever since the digital magazine Slate called it the greatest hoodie ever made. The article came out, and within 24 hours, we'd sold everything we'd ever made. Bayard Winthrop wants to inspire other companies to manufacture here. For him, the Made in USA label <laughs> creates both jobs and pride. So are you selling an idea, an image, as much as clothing? I think we're selling a value system. Stand for some things that matter. Stand for American manufacturing. Stand for the people that are making stuff. And when we buy things, when we do it consciously, when we do it with an eye towards understanding how these little votes that we make have an impact attached to them, uh, we'll be better off. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>